Taking a stand. Taking a stand means to take a firm position on an issue. Taking a stand means challenging the status quo. Etikaut walkouts, a struggle for equality. This is the Rio Grande, which flows the length of the Rio Grande Valley. It is a lush valley of citrus groves, where Mexican Americans, attracted by the agriculture industry, outnumber the Anglo population. The practice here has been one of domination, the Anglos dominating the Latins. In 1968, Mexican Americans were the most prominent group in the Rio Grande Valley, and despite this prevalent fact, the institutions in the area were primarily centered around the benefit of the Anglos, often discriminating against their Mexican American counterparts. The political, economic, and even educational sectors of society were all subject to obscure reasoning. From Rio Grande City to the coast of South Padre Island, Mexican Americans were seen as inferior, nothing more than future soldiers, farmhands, and low-skilled domestic workers. Eddie Couch, Texas is no exception. Their politics, despite being a profoundly Mexican American community, were dominated by two Anglos, Board President Billy Sullum and Superintendent of Schools A.W. Bell. Anglo families in the area also made, on average, $170,000 more than their Mexican American neighbors, who were usually forced into lower skilled jobs. Many Chicano students recognized the unfair treatment of their ethnic group 13 years after Brown vs. Board had leveled the playing field for all races in education. Hey Zeus. As I reached the limit of my swing and prepared to rush back on the counter swing, a great gong struck and thunder. It's gone. For an unmeasurable Bobby, Jesus, front and center. What'd I do? You spoke Spanish, you know the rules. Speaking Spanish, Ned Calchelso was prohibited as per school policy, and those who failed to abide were subject to humiliating physical punishments, oftentimes scarring children enough to suppress their Mexican American culture. <laughs> Students tired of this adverse censorship yearn for a course that highlighted the impact of Mexicans and Mexican Americans on the Southwest. However, when presented to the school board, the response was one of criticism toward the education of Mexican Americans, rather than a support of their cause. When the superintendent at, at Coach Elsa came out in front of everybody and said, you know, you, you want Chicano teachers? Which one of you has a degree? I will hire you right here, right now. I have the power. I can hire you. Well, none of you have a degree? Okay. You want, you want Chicano, Chicano studies? You, you, you want literature that talks about you and your history? Which one of you wrote a book? I will buy it. That was put up or shut up. And of course there were no Mexican American teachers. And surely no textbooks. For the past century, the Anglos took systematic steps to ensure that Chicanos, their history, culture, and perspective all remained silent. These young Mexican Americans yearned to learn and advance from Ed Couch, go to college, and learn about themselves, and better yet, their history, in order to bring back that same knowledge of Chicano studies to the children of Ed Couch. But every single time they presented their desires to continue on in their education to their counselors, people who were supposed to help them in reaching their goals, they were instead led on a path to a technical school, the military, or a sufficient means to be a housewife. Occupations in the eyes of the Anglos that were better suited by the Mexicans. Despite the fact that they lacked Chicano studies, equal opportunity at their school, and faced constant discrimination, by far the largest grievance of the Mexican American students was their inability to speak Spanish. Ground. Why is it very important to you that you be allowed to speak Spanish on the school grounds? Well, that's our mother tongue, so I don't see why it should be taken away from us. We're born of uh, uh, Mexican-American parents, and we have to speak Spanish to them, and they want us to forget our, our native tongue. I don't think that's fair for us. As a result, on November 7, 1968, a small group of students led by Javier Ramirez jotted down and delivered their concerns to school principal Melvin Pipkin requesting the man call a school board meeting in order to ensure that their grievances be heard. The principal took these concerns as a joke, comparing them to reading a comic book strip. 
Left with no other option, the youth of Ed Calchalosa High School, by the direction of their voice, Xavier Ramirez, took a stand and walked out. And on November 14th, 1968, over 175 students left their classes at Ed Calchalosa High School. They had given their concerns to the principal, waited patiently, and got nothing. It has been said, to be heard sometimes, you need to yell. If that is the case, this was a scream for help. This protest began what would become a two-month struggle for the political, educational, and equitable soul of the Rio Grande Valley, and not to mention the role of Mexican Americans in it. But this was going to be no easy fight, and the institutions in which they wished to reform were in no way ready to let this be a one-sided affair. Directly following the walkout, the principal held a meeting with some of the student leaders of the protest and finished off the exchange by saying, we will not yield one iota as long as I am principal. The students will not dictate policy. I will. The students, seemingly unaffected by their conference with the principal, continued to sage protest. And as a result, later that day, were arrested by the Ed Cachosa Police Department under charges of loitering followed by Pipkin. Bonds made by Ciro Casades and Joel Longoria of Elsa made their release possible. But while they were free, the damage had already been done. All credibility to the protesters had been lost. Many people now saw them as nothing more than shovel makers and in some instances, militant. And in a move aimed at swaying public support along with the arrest of the students, Superintendent Bell also made it absolutely clear that in the eyes of the school district, the schools were at no fault, and these students had no business protesting them. We do not have discrimination in the school system. There may be isolated cases of discrimination that we don't know about. And I say quite frankly, if we do have them, I'd like to know about them. Because we're not supposed to happen. Letters to newspapers sprang up all over the valley, bashing the Ed Couch protesters and their cause. This went to the monitor, even going as far as mocking their use of the word Chicano, stating, You have labeled yourself with the mark of ignoramuses. This piece continued on to an essence called Mexican American Spoiled, stating that countless persons would gladly pay for those privileges that you are stomping into the ground. The following day, all the students who participated in the walkout were suspended for three days. At the following scheduled board meeting on November 19th, Monday, names of the suspended youngsters taking part in the class walkout were submitted to the board for action on expelling them for the rest of the semester. Of the 175 students taking part in the demonstration, 34 were expelled for the remainder of the semester, while 94 remained on indefinite suspension. 47 were returned to school on probation. On November 22, 1968, attorney Bob Sanchez of McAllen helped to challenge the suspensions of the students by filing a lawsuit in the Federal District Court in order to reinstate the students into school. On the account that A, their participation in the walkout was only meant to bring valid complaints to the attention of the school board trustees, and B, without prior hearing in violation of their rights under the First and Fourteenth Amendments of the United States Constitution, this suit also alleged that the defendants had deprived plaintiffs of their public education without due process in violation of the United States Constitution. And on Thursday, December 19, 1968, Judge Ronaldo Garza agreed with them, deeming that the school board policy was unconstitutional in a civil lawsuit. These students were to be readmitted and the reasons for their expulsions to be erased indefinitely from their school records. The judge also stated that the school board policy prohibiting demonstrations and boycotts had been unconstitutional. These students had done it. Abused, battered, and denied time and time again, they overcame the odds and made sure that discrimination in the Rio Grande Valley will never go unchecked again. This is what taking a stand is all about. This is what taking a stand needs to be.